My name is Paul Jenkins, University Librarian, and I'll be talking to you today about some fun facts about the Beatles. I hope you recognize that one, the long and winding road. And yes, it's been a long and winding road in my life as I've encountered the Beatles. We are going to take a bit of a magical mystery tour today. This is a wonderful card that my wife sent me. There's lots of Beatles memorabilia out there. So where did it all start for me? It started with the album Rubber Soul. And here's the old tattered album itself from 1965 that my father bought me. Still my favorite album, actually. So I'm going to give you some fun facts about the Beatles. Um, and as we go along, I'm going to bop around from place to place. I am accompanied today by one of my friends here, a blue meanie. Also by my favorite Beatle, George Harrison. And besides the t-shirt I'm wearing, I have 47 Beatles t-shirts, believe it or not. That's the first fun facts about the Beatles. There's some very standard ones here that you've probably seen in stores. There are some more obscure ones that I've wasted lots of time and money in acquiring. This is one for Magical Mystery Tour. Many of them have to do with specific Beatles albums. Here's Revolver. And then, finally, I've made some Beatles t-shirts on my own. For example, this one. And for Beatles fans out there, that is in direct response to John Lennon's solo song, God, in which he said, I don't believe in Beatles. Well, I still believe in Beatles. And John still believed in the Beatles, too. He was going through a rough patch when he recorded that song. Anyway, starting off with some facts here. Um, 183 original compositions that the Beatles recorded in their studio days. Of them, 73 were mainly Lennon compositions. 69 were mainly McCartney compositions. And really only 17 were true joint compositions by Lennon and McCartney. We always hear about the Lennon and McCartney songwriting team, and that's how the songs are credited on the albums and in books. But really, mostly John would write a song and then Paul would help out, or Paul would write a song and John would help out. And George Harrison, again, my favorite Beatle, he wrote 22 of the songs that the Beatles recorded. Ringo Starr came in with two for all you Ringo fans out there. First thing I'm going to talk to you about are some selected firsts. The Beatles were in the vanguard. They were always setting the pace. They did things before other people did. For example, they had the first stadium concerts. Uh, everybody knows the famous 1965 Shea Stadium concert. And we take a lot of these things for granted now, but we had to remember the Beatles were the first to do many of these things. Music videos. The, uh, Movie 1964 movie Hard Day's Night actually kind of set the template for music videos for groups in the future. The use of fade in. We're used to songs fading out at the end, but fade in on such as on eight days a week was another innovation that they came up with. Also on She Loves You, Yeah, 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 the song started with a chorus. And again, we don't think of that as anything major these days, but that was the first time for a huge hit song that it started with a chorus instead of with a verse and then going into a chorus. Use of feedback and tape loops. So on the song I Feel Fine in 1965, it starts with intentional guitar feedback. This is before Jimi Hendrix. Backwards vocals and guitars. Um, they're, the Beatles loved to experiment, and they started to make use of a lot of these things around 1965, 1966. 
supplying printed lyrics. Again, this is something we take for granted these days, but when you look at the famous Sgt. Pepper album cover that everybody's familiar with, on the back, they included the printed lyrics to all the songs in the album. And again, this was a first, something we take for granted these days. Sampling. There is a sample of a Spanish guitar solo in an obscure song, um, by Beatles standards anyway, called the Bungalow Bill. And they sampled it for a, another um, musician playing a Spanish guitar. So that's another thing the Beatles innovated with. Benefit concerts. We think of benefit concerts as being fairly common these days, but uh, the concert for Bangladesh in 1971 that George Harrison um, instigated along with Ravi Shankar um, was the first huge celebrity benefit concert. So some other fun facts for you. Uh, Billboard magazine came out with an issue, I think in late 2019 or early 2020, and it listed the 125 best-selling artists of all time. Guess who number one was? Of course, the Beatles. But Paul McCartney's solo work is number 12 on the list. So if you combine the Beatles at number one and Paul McCartney at number 12 out of the 125, that gives you an idea of how important they were. Plus, George Harrison comes in at 124th on the list. He just snuck in there. John Lennon's solo recordings did not make the top 25, top 125, by the way. Number of books. So there have been more than 2,000 books written about the Beatles. Um, it's a staggering figure and something that I did for the uh, book that I co-edited with my brother called Teaching the Beatles. Um, was to write a bibliographic essay about the best 100 of those 2,000 books. And it's really a, a fun world to explore. My favorite book, perhaps, written about the Beatles is called Dreaming the Beatles by a guy, guy named Rob Sheffield. There's lots of great books about the Beatles out there, that, but this might be my current favorite. It's very um, wise and profound, but it's also written in a very kind of relaxed style. It's not too scholarly. The number one uh, selling album in the years 2000 to 2009 was the CD called One by our favorite group, The Beatles. So think about this. Um, by the year 2000, they'd been broken up for 30 years. And yet they released this number one album, which is a collection of all their uh, songs that reach number one. And it's the best selling CD between 2000 and 2009, just staggering how their influence continues to manifest itself. I'm going to give you some little known facts about John, Paul, George, and Ringo now. John loved cats. Paul's father was an amateur jazz musician. George loved to play the ukulele. In fact, he often gave parties where at the door, as guests arrived, he would hand them a ukulele and then they'd all play songs together later. George also had the first number one solo hit once the Beatles broke up, and he also had the last solo hit. So My Sweet Lord, was the first solo recording by a member of the Beatles to reach number one. And then I've Got My Mind Set on You was the last one to reach number one, both recordings by George Harrison. Ringo, uh, a fun fact about Ringo, he received more fan mail than any of the rest of the Beatles. And my secret theory is that the young ladies out there felt that he might have been more obtainable than the gods, George, John, and Paul. There was even a Ringo for President campaign in 1964, believe it or not. All the members of the Beatles are members of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as solo acts. So not only as the band itself, but each one as a solo act is a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland. Did you know that up until the Sgt. Pepper album, <clears throat> there were different versions of albums that the Beatles recorded, one for the American audience on Capitol Records 
and another for the Parlophone recordings or EMI recordings in the United Kingdom. An example of one of these American albums is the album Beatles 6. These albums were combinations of earlier Beatles albums put out in the UK, and then they would also take singles that the Beatles had put out but hadn't included on albums, and then kind of paste them together into um, additional albums to boost their revenues. Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields Forever were a double A-sided single that the Beatles released. Both songs were supposed to be on the Sgt. Pepper's album, but since it was taking so long to create it, their manager got nervous and wanted to rush out some singles to keep the band in the public eye. Now, strangely enough, these are two of their best songs and best-known songs, but this double-sided A single didn't even reach number one in the UK. A song by Engelbert Humperdinck, believe it or not, kept them from the top spot. Some facts about the song Yesterday. We, we all know the song Yesterday. Did you know it has been recorded by other artists more than 2,000 times? That's a record, of course. Also, when Paul McCartney woke up one morning, he had the melody stuck in his head, and he went around asking his friends and the other members of the group, what's this song? What's this song? It's stuck in my head. Well, it turns out there was no other song. It was the original melody he had dreamed up, literally. And at first, he didn't know what lyrics to set to it, and he uh, created a set of what are called um, placeholder lyrics, and they went a little something like this. Scrambled eggs. You've got such a lovely pair of legs. So he actually improved on those lyrics later on. Did you know that James Taylor's first album came out on the Beatles record album uh, label, Apple? One thing I like to do is, with my class in, in the Beatles course that I teach here, is to talk about what I call the FBI ratings. F is for fun, B is for beautiful, and I is either for important or innovative. So what I show them is that there are more Beatles songs that are, that are both fun and beautiful, or beautiful and important, or beautiful and innovative, and there's even a few that are all three, fun, beautiful, and innovative or important. So an example is like, all you need is love, I think ticks all three boxes. Hey Jude, I think ticks all three boxes. Penny Lane would tick all three boxes. And there's a lot of songs that tick two of the boxes, like Blackbird, for example, is beautiful and important because it's a song about the civil rights movement in America, but it's not necessarily a fun song. One thing that I talk a lot about with my class is the cultural impact that the band had. So they weren't only important as a musical act. They influenced the world of art, mainly through their album covers. They influenced the world of fashion. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, I do have a Beatles wig. I'm not going to put it on. I put it on for my class, and they got a big kick out of it. But it messes up my hair, so I'm not going to put it on right now. So art, fashion, spirituality, business, and film. They had huge impacts on all of these worlds. As a matter of fact, for spirituality, I'm going to read you a little quote here by a guy named Philip Goldberg in a book called American Veda. And he wrote that the Beatles' 1968 trip to India was the most momentous spiritual retreat since Jesus spent those 40 days in the wilderness. The media frenzy over the Fab Four made known to this sleek, sophisticated West that meek, mysterious India had something of value. Our understanding and practice of spirituality would never be the same. Pretty broad and sweeping statement. Did you know that <clears throat> there is a, both a plaque and a book that celebrate the day that John Lennon first met Paul McCartney? And that famous day is July 6, 1957. There is an entire book called The Day John Met Paul. There is a plaque in Liverpool, which I've seen, because of course I've been to Liverpool to visit all the Beatles sites. And there's a plaque saying, on this spot, on July 6, 1957, John Lennon first met Paul McCartney. 
There have been paintings of the events. It's been depicted in film. It was an important day. There's also an uh, Eleanor Rigby statue in Liverpool. And what people don't know is that there was actually a grave site at the Woolton um, Cemetery in Liverpool for a woman named Eleanor Rigby. And when asked about that later on, Paul McCartney didn't realize that. So it was probably hidden in his subconscious somewhere. There's uh, recently been a park dedicated to George Harrison in Liverpool. And there is another, um, we all know about Strawberry Field. There's no S on it, by the way, in Liverpool. But there is also a site in New York City called Strawberry Fields where you can go, and it's near the um, Dakota apartment building where John Lennon was assassinated in 1980. The Yesterday movie that came out recently shows um, both the fact that the Beatles are still in everybody's mind and the fact that we can't even imagine a world that didn't include the Beatles, which is sort of the premise of the film. There's also a very good book called Liverpool Fantasy by a guy named Larry Kerwin that um, has the Beatles breaking up in 1962 because of disagreements over which songs to record. And then they all go off and lead different lives, and they never become famous as the, as the Beatles. It's a fascinating book. What are my favorite songs? People ask me all the time, what are my favorite Beatles songs? For John, it's probably I Should Have Known Better from the Hard Day's Night album. For Paul, it's a song called For No One off the Revolver album. And for George, it's Think for Yourself from the Rubber Soul album. I'm going to end with some quotations now. There have been lots of great things written about the Beatles, said about the Beatles. Ozzy Osbourne said, the Beatles invented a new color. I always like that one. There's a great quotation from a Rolling Stone issue that goes as follows. The story of the Beatles was always in some ways bigger than the Beatles, both the band and its individuals. <clears throat> it was a story of a time, of a generation reaching for new possibilities. It was a story of what happens when you reach those possibilities and what happens when your best hopes come apart. Yes, it was a love story, and love is almost never a simple blessing. Because as much as the Beatles may have loved their communion, the world around them loved it even more. And then finally, I'm going to give you a quote from a Kurt Vonnegut novel called Time Quake, published in 1997. And this novel explores, among other things, time travel and free will. On the book's opening page, one of its narrators named Junior posits that a plausible mission of artists is to make people appreciate being alive a little bit. When asked by another character which artists were able to accomplish that lofty goal, Junior names the Beatles. So with that, I will close this presentation and remind you that all you need is love. Thank you very much. <laughs>